I just think right now, women, especially in business, this is the year of women. I just know that. Life begins at 150 grand a year. Life gets better at 250, and life gets real good at 500. Nobody can tell me differently on it. When you start teaching something, I feel like that's when you start to master the actual art of it. You and I, when we publish a book, we can go toe to toe with any of the New York trade publishers, any of the big time authors. We get to compete in that marketplace and then let the market decide whether our stuff is good. People forget sometimes as an entrepreneur, the whole damn point of entrepreneurship is to make money. And now here is The Win with your hostess, serial entrepreneur, marketeer, and chief sexy boss, Heather Havenwood. Have you ever wanted to stop swapping your time for money? Ever wanted to leverage your expertise by selling your knowledge to hundreds of people? I call that smart. And now you can easily and effortlessly, without a web guy, create memberships, online courses, coaching programs. Go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash thinkific. Start making money off what you know today. Go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash thinkific. Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Win with Heather Havenwood. I am excited today because I have someone on the line that I've actually read his books. I think he's amazing. He's an amazing personal development communicator, personality, and just a bad A. And one of his great books that I just really love is Grow a Pair, How to Stop Being a Victim and Take Back Your Life. Wow, is that not needed in today's life? So Larry Wingett, thank you for being here. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. And you're a Southern boy like me. Well, I'm not a boy, but Southern. Where are you from? Oklahoma. I grew up in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Mus I live in Arizona, though, now. So. Muskogee, Oklahoma. Have you heard of a place called Hevener, Oklahoma? I used to drive the bookmobile to Hevener, Oklahoma. No kidding. You're like the only person in the world. My mother grew up there, born and raised in Hevener, Oklahoma. Well, there you go. She's a Southern girl. So anyways, thank you for being here. And I just, you know, Larry Wingat, you're amazing. You've been all over on all kinds of Fox News and CNBC and all kinds of fun stuff. But instead of me reading a long bio or introduction like that, I'd like to just kind of open the conversation to, you know, just share with other people who you are and what you're all about. I am the trademark pit bull of personal development. I'm in the International Speaker Hall of Fame. I've written six New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestsellers. I've had my own show on a and &E. I'm a regular on Fox News and Fox Business talking about parenting and business and personal finance and the wussification of America. I am a straight shooter. I've spoken to over 400 of the Fortune 500 companies. I've been all over the world on stages talking to businesses and associations, organizations. Now I... Um, Try not to travel quite as much. I spend a lot more time writing and doing some personal coaching and still do about, I don't know, 40 dates around the country every year. Well, you have a very big, successful career. And what I love about it is that you're a straight shooter. Coming from Texas myself, my dad was a straight shooter in life. And I just figured I grew up that everyone was like that, Larry. And then I realized that, like your book, people are idiots. <laughs> and I could prove it. I love that. This particular podcast is about entrepreneurship and starting a business. And you said something really interesting earlier offline. You don't think people should, should start a business. I think 90% or better of the people who decide to become entrepreneurs never ought to do it. I wrote a blog about that. You know, I'm just amazed that people say, oh, I have a passion for it. That could be the most idiotic reason to ever go into business. Passion doesn't run a business. Passion is defined as a barely controllable emotion. And why would you pick passion as the emotion to run your business? Why don't you pick anger instead? It makes as much sense. We don't need emotions anywhere near our businesses. We need logic, common sense, and a, a mindset of profitability. That's the only reason to go into business. And the reason entrepreneurs typically do it is because they're passionate about it or because they love it or because their sister-in-law said, oh, you'd be so good at that. No, probably you wouldn't be. They haven't done their, their homework. They haven't read a damn book about how to market their business, start their business. Uh, they don't know how to read a balance sheet. They don't know how to talk to a bank. They don't know how to hire, fire, market, sell, anything. And yet suddenly they think they're qualified to be a business person. Oh my gosh, I love you. 
I completely agree with that. In fact, someone said to me, well, why don't you do, because I do bodybuilding. I do bodybuilding uh, for passion. I like it, but I don't, it's not my business. I actually do it because I like it. I don't make money at it. I don't want to make money at it. It's just something I do. It's like working out. Someone goes, well, you should, that's your passion. You need to make money at it. I'm like, hell Oh my God, no. that's stupid. I'm glad you told him no. I had, hell no. I don't, I want to go to the gym and have fun. I don't want to make, try to make money at it. And I don't, it's, you don't make a lot of money either. I mean, I do Here's not- the, you know, the deal is you ought to be passionate about your family yeah. and your life and your kids and your dog and be good at your business. That's the deal. We've got way too many people who are passionate about their business, but they're not any good at their business. And for some reason, they think people will pay them for their passion. I don't give a damn about anybody's passion. I pay for excellence. That's mm-hmm. it. And if I can get some, something better, and I don't care what it is, from somebody who is totally dispassionate about it, but they're amazing at it, I'll go with amazing every single time. <laughs> Thank you for this. This is really awesome. I kind of feel that same way about, I'm going to say the word, MLMers. Right. MLMers, they love the product or they love whatever the community of the business, but they don't understand what it actually means to grow an MLM company or a business. Or whatever. They don't understand what it takes to sell, to recruit, to sell, recruit, sell, recruit. The real ones actually can go business to business to business or company to company to company because they can do that. And I, I have a big thing about not having anyone on my show in MLM because I don't feel they're business owners. I can't say when they say, say that because here's why, Larry, and I, I bet you agree. They haven't written the check for anything. Did they write the check for that website? Did they write the check for the supplement name? Did they write the check for that label? Did they write the check to the manufacturer to get that supplement? No, they haven't written a damn check. So how in the world are they business owners? How do they feel that pain? What say you? Well, I think the biggest problem with MLMers is, again, that it feeds their ego and they get caught up in the dream of how much money could be made. I mean, all you have to do is get a thousand people to get a thousand people and on and on and on. Well, you know, that's really not how MLM works. Typically, you have very few people making any money in MLM, very, very few, and they're making it off of people who typically sign up, they buy their first package for 300 bucks, and now they've got 300 bucks worth of soap sitting in their... uh, in their garage that they're never going to use. And that's where the people way up the list really make their money from all those one-time buyers. And, and it's kind of sad that people get caught up in the emotion uh, and the dream of, I could make all of this. Well, yeah, you could. I guess I could go out and become an NBA player too if I was 40 years younger. But the reality is it ain't going to happen. And people need to get a little more focused on reality. Very few people make money in MLM, just very, very few. And so ask, if you're going to go into MLM, say, what does the average person make? And how long does it take to make it? Don't tell me what the top 3%, the top 3% in anything make all the money. But don't tell me what those people make. What's your average guy making? Your average guy's not making anything. That's very true. You know, my uh, boyfriend has a chiropractic business here and we deal with something called Obamacare and all kinds of weird things and write the check for local taxes and state taxes and everything else. I mean, I don't think people really understand the reality of starting a real business and overhead and employees and all that kinds of stuff. And so I have a question for you, Larry. You're obviously a, a best-selling author. However, what's the business you are in? What business do you think you're in? I'm the business of adding value. That, by the way, that's the business everybody's in, adding value. My product and service is different uh, than maybe someone else's, but I don't care whether you're selling dry cleaning or vacuum cleaners or, or clothes in a retail store, or whether you're like me selling books and speeches and ideas and opinions, it's all about adding value to people's lives. And we are rewarded based on how much value we bring to people's lives based on how much of a problem we solve. If you go to the dry cleaners and it costs a dollar and a quarter to dry clean your shirt, that's a dollar and a quarter problem. That's how much that problem is worth. It costs a dollar and a quarter to solve the problem, then the problem is worth a dollar and a quarter. If you're me and you get paid a whole lot of money to come in and give a speech, then that's the size of the problem I solve. And so Everybody needs to start thinking about themselves, regardless of what kind of business they're in or whether they're just an employer and and employee and have a job. I am paid in direct proportion 
to the size of the problem I solve. And when I understand that my value is determined based on the size of the problem I solve, and then increase my value by continuously solving bigger problems, I'll start to make more money. That's pretty powerful. When did you see that? I want to call that a business model. When did you see that? When did you see that that's actually the transaction that's happening in your particular business? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because a lot of people think that speaking and authorship is not a business. And I learned a long time ago in the direct response marketing world, it is a business if you create it as a business. If you look at it as a business versus just throwing books out there, that it is a business. So when did you see that? When I started in this business, for me, it was a business. I was selling dates on a calendar. That was a product, dates on a calendar. I never, ever had the delusion that I was changing the world or changing lives. How self-centered and selfish and egotistical it is when I hear some motivational bozos out there who say, I'm changing lives. No, you're not. I get those letters too. And I remind every time I get a letter from somebody say, you changed my life. I said, no, you changed your life. I just reminded you that you could and maybe gave you a couple of tools to do it. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Our whole world revolves around our smartphones now. You know they say we look at our phones on an average of 150 times a day or more. Look, if you're a small business and want to grow, you need to reach people where they're looking the most. Their smartphones So text the word START to 72,000 now to learn more from our friends at Mobit or go to heatherhavenwood.com forward slash Mobit. Again, text the word START to 72,000 now. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Speaking is a business. Back to that. I looked at it as a business when I got into the business. I came from the business of selling telephone systems, and I looked at my speech as a product just like I looked at a telephone system as a product. And I sold telephone systems to people by saying, this is the size of your problem, and this is the cost of my telephone system. If I can identify what your problem is worth to you and prove to you that my, my telephone system solves that problem and my telephone system costs less than the cost of your problem, then you'll buy it from me. Now, that's the way everybody ought to sell everything. What's the problem cost? What's the solution cost? And if you get the customer to understand what the cost of the problem is and agree with you and understand what the cost of your solution is and agree with you, and if your solution costs less than the problem, they will buy from you. And that's how I looked at speeches. Speeches solve a problem. I identify how much that problem costs them, and then my speech costs less than the problem. It's really so simple. I don't get it. (laughs) I completely understand. I just, I mean, I've been in the speaking industry since 2001 in different areas, and I just sometimes realize that, you know this, when you meet a lot of speakers, you can tell which ones look at it like a business, and they're selling dates on a calendar, or they're selling books, or they're selling you know, whatever their thing is, they look at it as a business versus a narcissistic opportunity to feel good about themselves, right? I mean, I'm sure you come across that yourself. <laughs> 90% um, of the industry is made up of those people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> know, that's why it's so refreshing to talk to you. Like, oh my God, you you actually get that. So I I have to say, telephone systems, I'm kind of dating myself. I, I started uh, working in Southwestern Bell Wireless uh, in Dallas in 1998. So I didn't sell telephone systems. I sold cellular phones, but the big brick ones. Remember those big, huge brick ones? They're about the size of your seat. Well, I'll date myself. I was the very first male telephone operator in Oklahoma oh my in uh, 1971. So I started as a male telephone operator and worked my way up until I left 15 years later as the area sales manager for AT&T for the state of Kansas. Oh, my gosh. I was in Dallas for Southwestern Bell Wireless, as my friend would call it. Southwestern Bell, SBC. You remember SBC Global? Yep, I remember. Yep, yep the, Bell, the Bell companies that are, that are no longer existence. Well, anyway, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. So inside of what's happening today, and I mean that in entrepreneurship world, I mean that kind of politically, personal development world, and Facebook and all the stuff that we have today, I feel like a lot of it's kind of become diluted. 
what are you seeing out there? You're, I mean, you're way more in the media than I am. And I think it's amazing. What are you seeing? What's the, the narrative that's being talked about that you would, if you could call it a complete BS? Oh, there's a lot out there that's complete BS. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So much. <laughs> Uh, you know, if I were to look at the biggest challenge we faced right right now in terms of politics and the economy, as well as in business, I'm going to go straight to the entitlement mentality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think entitlement mentality is the really, uh, next to ISIS, our biggest foe right now in our country, and will probably take us down more than any other thing. When we have people who believe they deserve anything, that's an issue. When you have 33% of 18 to 34-year-olds, millennials, moving back in with mom and dad, when you have 66% of boomers who are financially supporting their adult children in some way, when you have the fact that we're going to have in the marketplace, in the workplace, in the next 10 years, the millennials will be the, pretty much the entire workforce. And that's really going to be a challenge for businesses because there's a lack of commitment to showing up. There's a lack of commitment to serving others. It's all about me, 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 and never about you, you, you. And success in business is me focusing on you and serving you well. So those challenges right now, based on entitlement mentality, that's really pretty scary for us all to have to deal with. Here's a good question. So I grew up in Texas, like I said, and my and my mom and dad always I mean, I never had the opportunity to have another chance of like, you can come back if you fail, you know, we have a room for you that didn't that didn't happen. If I wanted a car, when I was 16, I didn't get it till I was 17, 18, because I didn't have the money. You know, I mean, I kind of grew up in that era. And I don't consider myself old, I'm 41. And for somewhere along the way, I woke up one day, and I'm like, what? Ha I don't understand what happened to them. Like, what happened? How is it? you know, five or six years younger than me, they have this particular view of the world. That's me, me, me. What do you know what? I mean, I know that's kind of a loaded question, but I don't get, like, I don't get it is what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm here locally in Austin. We we're in a tech, we're in a tech community and there's a ton of jobs here. And we've been trying to hire for the last six months and we've been getting these people and they're like, well, this is the, this is the amount I want. This is the hours I'm going to, I want this is, I'm like, who the because as a business owner, I'm like, okay, so if I pay you what you want, that means you have to create for me four to six times that. You're going you're gonna to bring in that amount of money? Well, no. So then what's the point? You're, you're supposed to come in, do a job for me, and make me ROI. I don't understand how you don't see that. <laughs> but they don't see that. And you wanted to know how we got there. Yeah, how? You know, my most important book, I've written six bestsellers, but my most important book is my parenting book, Your Kids Are Your Own Fault. And uh, what we did is, uh, in fact, I could go to every problem we've got right now in society, from the housing crisis in 08 to uh, lousy customer service to right on down the line, I could tie it all back to lousy parenting. We have parents who failed their children by teaching them that life is full of consequences and imposing those consequences, and that life is about respect and courtesy and honesty and integrity and those kind of core values. And we became a very superficial me, me, me society simply because mamas and daddies allowed it, encouraged it, and didn't impose consequences in any way. That's why we've got a crappy government right now. And that's why we've got two of the worst political politicians in the history of the presidential race is because we created that. We put up with that. When we put our foot down, this is what my book Grow Up Here is about. When we put our foot down and say, we're not putting up with this crap anymore, we're going to start standing up for what's right, and we don't, have, we don't give a damn who suffers in the process, that's when we will take our country back, that's when we take our businesses back, that's when we take our families back, and that's when we take our own personal pride and self-confidence back. But we become a nation of wussies and weenies who are afraid to stand up for what's right and stand up for what we believe in for fear of hurting somebody's feelings. And to hell with everybody's feelings. Who gives a damn if you got your feelings hurt or not or whether you're offended? I'm going to do the right thing and say what I believe regardless. And that's how we have to run our businesses and our government, and that's how we have to vote. You know, it's interesting. My, I remember one time my dad, I was think I was whining. I was like 10 years old. And I said, life's not, that's not fair. And my older sister took something. And he looked at me and goes, life isn't fair. Get over it. You know, and I think kids forgot that lesson. Life isn't supposed to be fair. 
life isn't supposed to be fair. And I, I love that you're saying that. I just got back from Cancun. Um, I just got engaged actually a couple of days ago. Congratulations. And, thank you. But I found it really interesting that we were in Cancun for a week. And these people, Larry, were they wanted to be there. They were so amazing. They would say, with pleasure, thank you. How can I serve you? I was just, I literally was like, can you just say that again? <laughs> I don't even, I never get that custom, kind of customer service here. In June, we went to Vegas for a week and we stayed at the Win, an expensive place in Vegas. And we didn't even get a quarter of the kind of service that we got at the Win that we did in Cancun. I mean, these people wanted to be there. They wanted to work. They were so respectful and nice and loving and fun and just great to talk to versus my experience in Vegas, the people were like, always had their hand out, like, give me money, give me money, then I'll talk to you, then I'll be nice to you, then I'll do something for you. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Are you over 45, 60? Are you relying on the traditional medical field to help you feel great and get you back to a balanced body? Good luck with that. At E2Lab.com, Dr. Don Salio got sick of people complaining about bloating, inflammation, and feeling sluggish. He has created unique, potent, and powerful non-pharmaceutical supplements to help the body rebalance, detox, and get back to being healthy. Go to E2Lab.com, getting you back to healthy and balanced. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Right now, it's the responsibility of every parent to understand what their core values are, but it's also the responsibility of the parent to then teach those to children. The problem right now is we have parents who weren't taught those, and now they have kids. And so it's just going to get worse unless the few of us who get it stand up and demand it. What do you think that looks like? What does that look like to stand up and demand a change and alteration? What does that look like? Well, let's just take it from the top to the bottom. First of all, you determine what your core values are. What do you believe in that you'll never compromise? Really, that's sort of the core message of Grow Up Here. What do you believe in that you'll never compromise? If I held a gun to your head, you'd say, nope, I still believe that. For me, it's honesty, integrity, serving people well, doing the right thing no matter what. My list goes on. I got sort of a top 10. But if I asked most people that on the street, they would look at me like a dog looking at a ceiling fan. And that's what most people would respond with if I said, tell me things that you believe in that you'll never compromise about because they don't know their core values. So it starts with us determining what we really believe. If integrity matters to us, then you can't vote for anybody who's running right now. If honesty matters, you can't vote for a liar. And if honesty matters to you and integrity matters to you like you say it does, then the next time the phone rings and your kid answers it, you don't whisper to them, tell them I'm not here. Because now you've just taught your kid to lie for you. If honesty, integrity, and hard work and having a work ethic matters to you, then that means that you don't get to do anything on the internet, on your personal social media, while you're being paid by your employer, because if you do, you're a thief. And yet the average office worker spends two hours a day doing that, another 25%. 25% of the time they're getting paid by their employer, they're stealing their wages by not doing their job. So when you get real practical about this, it comes down to core values and then running your life from top to bottom by those core values and doing the right thing. And when we don't see it, we demand it. If you are my employee and I catch you uh, on your Facebook page, I'll tell you once, I'll fire you the second time. And then the people say, well, Larry, if you just fire people for stuff like that, they'll sue you. Fine. Sue me. Sue me. I'd rather fight an idiot on the outside of the company than on the inside of my company where my customers and their coworkers get corrupted by that kind of stupidity. But see, bosses won't fire people. And right down the list, we can go on forever. But it comes down to knowing what you believe in and being willing to stand up for it even when it's difficult, even when it's humiliating, even when it costs you money. It's interesting you say that. The core values, I think, for me, I know, are integrity and freedom. Those are my real big core ones, is freedom and integrity with what my word is. If I say so what, what does freedom mean? Is that How can that be a core value? Help me. I'm interested. Sure. So for me, a freedom to be able to be free to make the choice. So let me, I'll say where it comes from. For me, 
I started working for Southwestern Bell Wireless, and I was basically number one in the top, on the top in the entire country for their um, sales. And then came back from getting my award or whatever you want to call it, hopefully a Robolex, but I didn't get that. And they, they pulled on my accounts away. And there, I felt like there was this part of me that was pulled away, like I had to start over again. And I thought, I want to be able to be free to be able to build my own life and build my own business. And the only people that can really take that away from me is me or the government or something like that, tax, whatever. But like, I need to be responsible 100% for all of it. That's for me, I think, freedom. For me, that's my value. Well, in my opinion, that would say that freedom is the result of having the core values of you refuse to be mistreated. Oh, I like that better. Thank you. Thank you for rephrasing that. Yes. <laughs> that was my start of entrepreneurship. I was like, I want to build something and build a business. And I just don't want to have to wake up one day and everything be taken from me without, without some kind of like, well, I did that. I, you know what I mean? Like I, I need to be sure. responsible and be a hundred percent responsible. Um, and so I'm willing to take that on a hundred percent and, and go on my own. Right. And I think that's, I don't know where that came from. I just remember that moment, right? I'm just like, screw this. I'm out and I'm going to go create my own thing. Not sure what that is yet. <laughs> that was my thing. Been there too. I was with Southwestern Bell, AT&T. And when yeah. divestiture happened, I was standing in front of all those employees and reading the, the uh, golden parachute package to everybody yeah. that was there. I stopped halfway through and said, I'm out. Somebody else can finish this meeting. I'm out. I'm filling out this paperwork. This is my last day to work here. Yeah, it's, it's I'm with you. That's kind of what happened. They pulled on my accounts away. And then my so-called boss looked at me and goes, okay, now start over. Yeah, that's what they always do. We punish. And see, that's what we do we in business. Let's go back to entrepreneurs and small yeah. business people. Okay. That's what we do in business, and that's what we've done in society. We cater to the lowest common denominator. We punish our best, and uh, we uh, reward our worst. We do that with employees. You ask the average manager, where do you spend your time? I spend my time with my problem employees. That's what they'll tell you. I've asked a million of them. Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just fire all your problem employees and spend your time with your good employees? It makes more sense to me. We do that with society. We cater to every whiny group and individual out there, and we sacrifice the best among us by not giving them any attention. You know, when we've got a, on college campuses today, when somebody Six writes days. Trump on the sidewalk in chalk, and we spend $50,000 on that college campus putting together counseling programs for those sensitive little snowflakes that got offended by the name of a presidential candidate, there's something wrong. That's catering, spending money for the lowest common denominator. And that example is just one of hundreds that we could go through and that I just included in my new book. My new book, by the way, is called What's Wrong with Damn Near Everything. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. uh, when is it going to be out? It'll be out in the spring. Awesome. Oh, I love that. Say that yeah. again. Say the title again. What's wrong with damn near everything? What's wrong with it? That's so true. And the catering, the safe space things. I'm not sure when that all happened. The safe space. College. Yeah. By the way, do you have a safe space that you can run to in your business? No, it doesn't no. exist in the real I world. Wish. Safe spaces don't exist. But see, that's catering to the lowest common denominator. And that's what we've done in society. And why have we done that? It's sort of like your freedom issue. It's because we didn't have a core value, and that was the result of no core values. So, you know, in the world of entrepreneurship today, and I understand what you're saying, that you don't really support everyone doing it. I agree with that. I think it, it takes a particular kind of mindset to do it. And I think right now it's been kind of what I call sexy and savvy to, you know, go to Silicon Valley and start an app, and then hopefully they get all kinds of money. And I, I, I completely agree with you. Not everyone understands the concept between business and an idea. And what I mean by that, I want to get your take on it, as I'm part of a mentorship group here in Austin where we spend our time working with uh, companies that are what I call going through that time, that phase called Clean Tech Open. It's a mentorship program. And right now where I'm working with a group, I've pretty much pulled away because I'm just so irritated. And she's in college and she has an idea. She has an idea but no business. And so I said, I think, you, I think you're in the wrong place here. You think an idea is a business. If you can't figure out what the idea is and how can it serve, serve communities or businesses or whatever, 
then you have an idea, sell the idea to someone to go create a business around it. I don't think you understand the difference between an idea and understanding how to actually create a business around an idea to add value to the world. And uh, yeah, they're at a standstill. So my question to you is, people that are, are entrepreneurs, they are these sort of trying, how would you say to them, hey, this is not a good idea for you, or it is a good idea for you, and you need to keep going, but you need to kind of like chill out. Can you tell the difference between what I call an entrepreneur and someone who needs to go back and get a job? You said it's a mindset, and I'll disagree with that. I think it's a commitment. I always judge people's commitments and whether they're willing to do the work to follow through. I can't tell what's inside somebody as far as their mindset is concerned. I can always, always measure their level of commitment based on how hard they're willing to work and what links they're willing to go to to make that idea into a business. People who sit back with, like you said in the, your example, that they sit back with their idea and say the idea has value. Listen, I don't care what, nothing has value. Nothing has any value unless you can prove that to a customer and get them to pay you for it and you can deliver it. Everything is just an idea up until that point. So what are you going to do to prove that your idea can be turned into a product that can solve people's problems, then then ask them to pay you for it, and then you deliver it. And when you show me that you have a commitment to making that happen, then I'll start to believe you might have it. It goes back to what I said earlier about entrepreneurs. I can walk up to people and say, well, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. Well, how long have you been doing it? Well, six months. Okay, how many books have you read about being an entrepreneur? And they go, what do you mean? What kind of market analysis did you do in your area to see if there was even a need for your product? What are your competitors? Because everybody's got a competitor. What do they charge? What's their profit margin? And let me see your balance sheet. And they go, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not that far yet. Well, then you never should have started in business. It's like people who write a book and then wonder how they're going to make it a bestseller. Why don't you build a following first and then write a book so the following will, will buy your book and it will become a bestseller? We get the cart before the horse. And that's what entrepreneurs do. And that's why I absolutely believe that at least 90% of them ought to just go get a job. I concur. I love that. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Are you a business owner that has a website but not tech savvy? Do you feel like a hostage to your web guy? The better question is, do you have a money funnel so people come to your page and give you money while you sleep? No? Then go watch free video at heathermakesyoumoney.com. Imagine having a money site, not a website, for your self-published book, e-commerce products, local practitioners like chiropractors or lawyers. Get a money site, not a website. Go watch free video at heathermakesyoumoney.com. Be the boss of your life. You're listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. And speaking about the book real quick, I have a book out called Sexy Boss, and I wrote the book in November 2013, but I didn't do that big, like, you know, Amazon bestseller push, you know? Amazon's not a bestseller, by the way. It's true, right. So I didn't didn't do that. And then about actually January this year, I found out that my book was actually top 10 on, on Amazon, but it came naturally because I built a following, not because I did this big push or anything like that. Well, when you realize that 97% of books sold sell less than 3000 copies in their lifetime. Really? I didn't know that. That's the stat. 3,000, less than 3,000. Over the life of the book. Wow. That, I didn't know that. If I don't sell 3,000 the first two hours that my book is released, then my publisher will never buy another book from me. <laughs> I'm about to say, I'm like, I'm pretty sure you've sold more than 3,000. But that's the average book. Yeah, that's taking all consideration. And so how long have you been doing this? You mind? When did you get started in this business of speaking? Uh, this is my 25th year in the business. Awesome. I, love I started out as a typical motivational. I started as a sales trainer, found out they'll pay you more to make people laugh than learn how to sell. And I was really funny. And so I became sort of a motivational humorist. And then about 10 years into the business, I discovered I hated every word that came out of my mouth. And I was going to tell people the truth, whether they liked it or not. And if I, uh, if I couldn't make a living telling people the truth, I'd just go back to selling telephone systems. 
The next time I went out, a guy heckled me, and I turned on him and told him to shut up, stop whining, and get a life, and the audience gave me a standing ovation when I said it. And I said, that's a good line. I think I can build on that. And that's when I became the pit bull of personal development and so forth and took on this attitude. So if you don't mind, because I, I, I love the speaking business and I've been around so long, do you consider yourself in personal development? Because you know how they try to niche you, you know what I mean? Like, are you a sales? Are you a motivation? They try to niche you in speaking, you know? So, so do you consider yourself in the business side, a personal development speaker? Well, yeah, I do. I'm in the personal development industry. I'm really not niched as a speaker because, well, in 1994, I stood in front of a couple of thousand speakers and said, I'm about to create a new genre of speaking. You can be leadership speakers and sales trainers and so forth. I'm going to become the first personality speaker. And I'm going to have people hire me because I'm Larry Wingate, and it doesn't matter what comes out of my mouth. And they all laughed at me. And I said, you watch, I'm going to create an industry around me. And uh, I did that. And I, that's why I think I'm probably the best branded. It's certainly the most recognizable brand in personal development today. From the style to the shirts to the, you know, the appearance right down the list. I have the best branded style in personal development. And so you also add to that that, that I created this genre around my personality, the fact that I can't be labeled a business speaker or a parenting speaker because I have one point of view, a very singular point of view. My point of view that sums up 25 years of speaking and six bestsellers is your life's your own damn fault. And I take that philosophy, that point of view, and I drive it across a number of different areas from parenting to finance to employment and business and and personal development, and, and right on down the line. So I can take a singular point of view and drive it across lots of different areas. While I'm in personal development, you got to remember, I've still spoken to over 400 of the Fortune 500 companies because companies are smart enough to realize if I give them information that helps their employees have more personal responsibility on the job and work harder, they benefit. So that goes back to that, what's the cost of the problem? We have employees that won't take responsibility and won't do what they were hired to do. That's what I make them do. So your entire philosophy of 25 years, I want to repeat it because I just love it, is your life is your own damn fault. That's it. That's, that's great. I, I mean, and thank you for saying that. By the way, when you stood in front of those thousands of people and said you're going to create a new genre of personality speaker, was that NSA? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I haven't been a member since 2004 either. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, me too. I, I think my last one I went to was in Orlando. They had an event probably like 2003 or four. I probably, I might have crossed you in the path of uh, the Orlando, whatever, Hilton or whatever it was. Well, yeah, the Orlando uh, Marriott down there is where yeah. it was. That was the year I went into the Speaker Hall of Fame was at that yes. convention. I probably did see you then because I was there. I lived in Orlando at the time. And you're probably right. It probably was the Marriott. I don't remember to be honest. Yeah, they're always at Marriott. So <laughs> Marriott's. You're, pretty, you're better than me. Well, I just want to, you know, wrap it up and I just, you know, where can people find you, Larry? What's going on with you? What, how can they work with you or hire you? What's going on? Well, get a whole bunch of money together. All right. And then call me. Now, listen, the best way to, to find out what I'm doing is just go to LarryWingett.com. I'm also real easy to find on social media. I probably got one of the most interactive Facebook pages in the world uh, at Larry Wingett fan page. We mix it up on there. And if you're being an idiot, I'll tell you you are. But you can go to my website and look at, find links to all my YouTube videos. Uh, I shoot a weekly thing called Ask Larry Anything. I've got an online university. That I've got an app. All that information is all on there. There's a lot of free stuff on there. So just go there if you want to find out more. Awesome. Check that out at LarryWingit.com. And just last words, Larry, what is a, other than, I mean, you have, a, you already said that in the 25 years, your life is your own damn fault, but what is like a, a life lesson that you would want to leave with people today? Success comes from sacrifice. We got way too many people saying you can get, and they talk about you can get more success. No, you got to give up to get success. You don't get skinny. You give up what's making you fat. You don't get rich. You give up what's making you broke. 
and you don't get successful, you give up what's making you unsuccessful. That's how it works. People need to identify what they're going to give up and sacrifice, and that's when they're left with what will make them successful. That's powerful. Wow. Well, thank you, Larry, so much for your time. That was pretty powerful. I completely agree. And uh, again, thanks for being here on The Win with Heather Havenwood. Check us out at heatherhavenwood.com. Thank you for listening to The Win with Heather Havenwood. Interested in coaching with Heather? Go to heatherhavenwood.com and sign up for a business discovery consultation. Here is your free gift for listening. Get three audio chapters of Heather's book, Sexy Boss, How Women Empowerment is Changing the Rulebook, when you text the word sexy to 7200. Again, text the word sexy, that is S-E-X-Y, to 7200 and receive your three audiobook chapters. Number is good only in North America. This is a sexy boss rap. This podcast is a copyright of Havenwood Worldwide, LLC.